Better Television. Jean? Welcome. Happy Monday. This is Jean Adrian, and you are on Power Talk on Facebook Live and NewYorkTelevision.com. And I'm so glad to be with you guys this week. Um, yeah, Mercury Retrograde sort of did a number on a couple of the shows, but hey, it's gone. We survived it. It might have been the most br brutal one. <laughs> I've been through it a while, um, but here we go. So I've got a really good show for you tonight. My guest is Dr. Frank Pasciutti. He is a licensed clinical psychologist and a certified hypnotherapist. He's associated with the Monroe Institute, which really intrigues me. And he's the author of a brand new book. His book is called The Chrysalis Crisis. And this is a pretty amazing book. Um, I really relate to this because I've had some chrysalis crises myself, Frank. So, <laughs> right. Um, yeah, no, so, I think we all have. Am I, oh, am I on? Yeah, we're good. So um, why did you choose to pick that title for your book? Well, actually, it came to me um, when I was reading a little story about a young girl who was um, in her backyard and was intrigued by a caterpillar that created a cocoon for itself and and she uh watched the process over time until the caterpillar like uh, metamorphosized into a uh, butterfly and noticed that the butterfly was uh at one point when it was breaking out was struggling to free itself from the cocoon and i thought it was interesting because um what she did is she she tries to help it and she ends up of course, you know, injuring the butterfly, and the butterfly falls down, and 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 she's devastated, and she runs in and tells her mother, and her mother says, you know, that butterfly needed to struggle because the struggle not only freed itself from the cocoon, frees it from the cocoon, but also helps strengthen its wings for flight. Right. So I thought, well, what a nice metaphor that is for how we work our ways out of various crises in our life, where even after maybe we go through the initial adjustment period. The areas that we struggle in terms of integrating the experience or healing from it oftentimes leads us to gain growth, much of which can sometimes lead to transformation. So I thought Absolutely. that would be a nice metaphor for the book. Oh, yeah. You know, and um, as an aside for all of that, I think that, that most people don't realize that when they try to support, quote unquote, support people through crises, that more often than not, they're not helping. They're actually causing them to not be able to develop their strength. And I think that's one of the things that people rush to do is to come in and fix when you're undergoing a crisis. Um, well, that's, that's true. Maybe the very, the very areas that you struggle with to try to get through the crisis may have been areas that have always needed a certain amount of work in your life. And, yeah, for um, sure. In the aftermath, sometimes, you know, it's not like you wish you, you really feel happy that you had that crisis, but mm -hmm. oftentimes people look back and say, wow, I really learned a lot as a result of that. I've oh, changed. my gosh. Yeah. I mean, and I attest to this because three years ago, I was hiking in the North Georgia mountains. I tripped on a route. I went flying through the air. I impaled my face on a stump and lost the sight in my eye, um, right. you know, uh, almost died. I mean, if that stump had been you know, a millimeter longer... Uh, it would have been in my brain. Um, and so that was a, uh, a life changing moment for me. Um, and it could have gone either way. I mean, I could have fallen into deep despair and um, become a victim and woe is me. And what am I going to do with the rest of my life? And blah, yeah. blah, blah. Um, but it was probably the most pivotal moment in my life and the most transformative for all the ways you list in your book. So that's why I was really enjoying your, your book because it, it spoke to me at a heart level. That's great. Well, I'm glad you found it helpful. And, you know, um, one of the uh, intentions of the book was not only to, um, to address some very conventional ways in which we uh, have a certain set of skills uh, or a certain range of, of capacities, if you will, Mm. Uh, it's very broad. It obviously addresses uh, basic uh, functions like the phys our physicality, our intellectual area growth, our emotional, social, and moral. Uh, and then in the middle part, I address um, these those 10 key areas of growth, the middle three being 
um, identity, intuition, and existential. On many of these kinds of problems will be the focus for people coming into therapy. But one of the two of the areas that I was intrigued with and have always had a fascination with are what I have identified as the in intuition and spiritual growth areas, and those are usually um, precipitated by um, what you what has been called and it still is called spiritual emergencies. Yeah. And, and so I try to take a new term, and that's why I use the chrysalis crisis term because I thought they're all, in essence, especially if somebody has an emer uh, spiritual emergency, forms of crises but they seem to implicate different key areas that we experience mm -hmm. and wanted to build a bridge there. Even it's a very wide bridge, but it, inc it includes those areas. Yeah. And, and I found that all that part fascinating. I, I liked that part more, you know, I resonated more with that part than the rest sure. of it because sure. I mean, my accident losing the sight in an eye has um, accentuated my other senses. Uh -huh. You know, wow. and the the most predominant one is my sense of smell. Wow. That, that's, that's like a, a crazy um, yeah. thing, you know. I mean, I've always been sensitive to smells. Um, mm -hmm. But, boy, now if I get around people that have on too much perfume or the slightest bit of an off thing about food or something like that, it's like, whoa, it's in my face. It's interesting. Literally. Yeah. Wow. It's crazy. But – it did open my intuition. I mean, I, I'm an intuitive. That's what I do for a living. Oh, okay. um, but it did open my intuition much greater than it was before. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, even to the point that I just finished writting my fifth book. Um, oh, that all you. came after that. Congratulations. You know? So, yeah, it, it really it was a, a pivotal area. So um, the 10 areas that you picked. Why don't you just pick those those ten? I mean, there's so many well, different areas you could. They're very, in. they're very, they're very broad and inclusive. I started asking myself, what over 45 years of doing therapy, what are the areas that people, you know, when somebody comes in and deals with this, it could be the same set of circumstances, or you know, unique to them, maybe going through a divorce or the death of a loved one. Mm. You know, what is it that, you know, what is it that um, the work tends to focus on? So let's say you lose a loved one. Um, and, uh, you know, we're all, we're all going to have to grieve if we lose somebody we love. Some mm -hmm. people are more capable of doing that. Uh, they may be more, um, they may have a higher, which you might call emotional IQ. They can deal with, they can both register and express appropriately maybe their, their sadness, their anger, their fear. And so if, if there's an emotional component to healing, they're, they're better positioned for that. However, maybe if that person was, um, uh, someone who wasn't very social, uh, that may challenge them to grow in the aftermath of losing that significant person in their life. So even with the same set of circumstances, sometimes, you know, one, one or a couple of key areas may come forward as those that um, are most in re requiring growth for them to get through that experience. So for me, I just, I thought back and I thought, what are these, what are the areas? Like somebody will come in maybe after like one of the fellows in, in examples I use in the book after having a heart attack. Mm -hmm. And so for him, uh, there was, uh, you know, it's not usually isolated in one of the 10 areas, but for him, it was really, uh, uh, he had to do some, make some major changes physically. He was out of shape, wasn't exercising, was smoking, was stressing. Um, and so the change and the transformation for him after that largely took place physically, but he also had other areas that he needed to look at, like how he was dealing with, emo with emotions, how he was, you know, um, dealing with other, other things in his marriage and stuff like that. So those were, and for me, one of the sub areas that I have had the, the good fortune to get referrals in, because I'm near the Monroe, involved with the Monroe Institute and also the University of Virginia Division of Perceptual Studies, which uh, researches areas like near-death experiences and, mm -hmm. you know, survival and reincarnation, is that many times when people have anomalous experiences, like a premonition or clairvoyant experience or maybe an out-of-body experience, they'll call them. And what happens is they're researchers, they're not therapists. And when I made a connection with them early on when I came here 40 years ago, they'll send them to me. So I've had a, a good yeah. fortune of having a number of people over the 40 years who've always, always, you know, maybe, you know, five or 10% of the people on my caseload would be dealing with issues that are related more to those transpersonal kinds of experiences. Yeah. And that's amazing. And that's what a gift that you're there for those people. Because when I opened up, 
to channel. I mean, one night I'm driving down the road and I hear a man's voice in my car telling me that I'm done with everything I've done up to that point in my life. And I'd yes. never heard voices before, you know, mm-hmm. um, and I had nobody to talk to about it. My husband thought I was crazy. Um, it took about five years for our marriage to fall apart because I kept getting crazier and crazier, you know, as these voices continued. Um, and really I was just opening up to my destiny, what, what I'm here to do. Um, yeah, but it, it, it's hard when you have, when, when you feel alone and isolated, you know, I just came back from a conference I went to in Atlanta last weekend and it's called assist the American center for the integration of spiritually transformative experiences. Whoa. And it's, it's really a good for your, any of your listeners and anybody who has experiences. It's basically uh, the, the, the bulk of the conference or the people who attended are therapists who work with people who have experiences like that so they can integrate them and not quickly, you know, designate them as, you know, pathological or having right. problems. And, and, um, and that's an interesting area. I kind of consider them my tribe. It's very focused on people who've had experiences or therapists who've had experiences who are also working with other people who come forward, you know, with a certain amount of trepidation to say things like, you know, I saw a spirit or I had an out-of-body experience or I had a precognition and, you know, not knowing what they're going to be met with. Right. Yeah. And, you know, that's interesting because I had never really thought about having therapy myself until that happened. And I didn't, it never occurred to me that that would have been appropriate at that time. I did go into therapy after my marriage fell apart. Because, you know, the common denominator in all of that was me. And I thought, I better figure out what's going on with me, you know, to. I've, um, certainly, I've certainly been on the other side of the couch many times. Yeah. find it helpful, especially when you're kind of like wanting somebody to hold the rope while you sort of dive down into those darker places in yourself. And, you know, you want to have somebody you can connect with and feel safe and secure and, and like they'll help uh, help you, uh, you know, antis- how, analyze what you're fa- confronting. But yeah, yeah, no, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's all, I, it, my, one of my beliefs and one of the things I express in the book is this, well, these are all, these are, these 10 key areas are all, if you will, uh, aspects of consciousness, you know, um, and, um, one of the influences that I've had, uh, in my life is the, is, the, um, what they call the top down approach to consciousness, which is consciousness already exists around us and within us. And we download it, if you will, through our brains and so the idea of the range in which we experience consciousness as humans, we have a physical aspect, you know, we have an intellectual, we have an emotional, and all these others are all capacities of consciousness. Mm-hmm. And so uh, I try to offer, when people have these exceptional experiences, many times, you know, they're, they just want to be assured that they're not crazy. And I'll sometimes say to them, you know, there's a difference between what you might call abnormal normal and supernormal. And I put it on a continuum for them. Mm-hmm. I'll say, you know, if there is, you know, something going on, it is abnormal, you know, we're going to help you with it. If you're hallucinating or if you're not, you know, if this is not a product of say some transpersonal effect, on the other hand, it may not be so normal because some of these things are exceptional, right? Yeah. But the other word for it, one that uh, Frederick Myers came up with back in the turn of the 19th century, he and uh, William James, who started the psychical association, um, he called them supernormal. So, mm-hmm. well, you know, and, and he even said that some that there may be a day where some of these capacities and faculties may become more, you know, more available to us as we evolve as humans. And uh, what may be considered supernormal today may be more normal or may be seen more frequently, seen more normal. And, and I think that that's happening uh, in today's world. I believe that to be a, a common occurrence now. Sh- sure. Yes. I mean, especially if you look on Facebook, um, Mm -hmm. on any given day, uh, depending on who your friends are, um, Mm -hmm. you know, there's all manner of psychic phenomenon that's talked about, uh, you know, people that are willing to channel for you or read tarot cards for you and things like that. And when I, you know, when all this started happening for me, that wasn't the norm. I didn't know people like that. Of course, we didn't have Facebook then either. That was 2002. So. I also I also um, remember back when I was in graduate school getting my doctorate back in nineteen in the middle seventies, meditation and yoga were not all that popular. You know, I, yeah. I remember you know starting uh, getting introduced to meditation uh, as a teenager, late teens, and um, and the idea of doing yoga. I mean, some of the stuff is very common now, which is great because people are going to get themselves in states of consciousness that are going to be conducive to having 
uh, transpersonal experiences. And I think that that's one of the things that I try to bring home in the book is like when you have an experience, when you one could be one could be curious about these things and want to do research and understand them. But the other one is when you have an experience, really are you know affirmed. Like somebody has a near death experience uh, and actually projects out of their body and has an out of body experience. Uh, and it has it corroborated, you know, some of the things that they witnessed while they were maybe being resuscitated after a heart attack. It's easy for them to appreciate that maybe they're, that their spirit is real. It's not mm-hmm. some religious belief that they're told there's an afterlife. They're really going to have a sense that my awareness was outside my body. <laughs> so, you know, in my, I'm going to maintain awareness uh, and, and where you might consider that a spirit state. Absolutely. And, you know, um, I, when I had my accident, uh, <laughs> I was conscious full time. I never was in any pain or anything like that. And I remember as they were wheeling me into surgery, I thought, oh, God, I sure do hope I have a near-death experience. I really want to see Jesus <laughs> yeah. or an angel or anybody yeah. like that. You know? I know. Come on, I know. bring them on. I'm ready. And when I came out of surgery, it was like, well, damn it. I, you know? None of that happened. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's interesting. I've never had one of those near-death experiences, although I had an operation last year right around this time for 12 and a half hours. And I, I think my wife, I think she said she tried to plan something or was trying to think about something that she could do and uh, get the permission of the you know surgeons that were working on me to, uh, to maybe uh, offer something that if I had an out-of-body experience, I could identify it. But I didn't. I was <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I guess it's not something you can, like, make happen, right? <laughs> yeah, I, yeah. Well, you know what? I do think, and actually the Monroe Institute, uh, Bob Monroe, he has a book called Far Journeys. When I first came to town, he offers a technique. For people who want to try to develop the capacity to project outside their bodies. And I think some people pull it off. Mm. It, it is doable. It just takes some um, learning how to get into a state of consciousness um, that is conducive for having that, maintaining awareness. They call it mind awake, body asleep state. It's usually the brainwave theta that you su- sort of can su- suspend yourself in, or similar to lucid dreaming, where people can ma- yeah. maintain. Um, that state of dreaming, but also be conscious at the same time. Now, I do do that. That yeah. that's one. Uh, not always, and I never know when it's going to happen. But it, you know, it does happen. And I know I've got a really dear friend who has taken remote viewing yeah. um, to a place where she's actually able. She can put her hand on a race car and remote view into the race car and find problems with the engine. That's and tell the team, yeah, it's crazy. Well, that's a practical application. It is. It is. <laughs> I bet uh, well, you her yeah. dad was a race car team owner. Oh, and I see. Well, so I see. it happened by accident. You know, that's she was just walking through one day, laid her hand on the race car, and they were having problems with it. And she goes, "Well, it's the blah blah blah," you know. <laughs> and they went, and it was. And so then they have started teams have been paying her to yeah. help diagnose their race cars, no, to you know, help them win races. You can't Just, argue with the fact that she's uh, identifying things that need to be fixed. You know, I have a friend and colleague, Joe McMonigle, who I consider the Michael Jordan of remote viewers. He's uh, quite gifted, and he's um, uh, a main person over at the Monroe Institute. And he was one of the few people who the CIA built a program around about 30 years ago when they realized that, you know, there can be ways in which information can be gleaned. And he had helped he had had two near-death experiences he was a marine and he and he, and he looks very different than you would expect when you see him but he was very he's very gifted and um he has um he and a few other hal put off and, uh, and i think a few other people who were it was out in uh, california they were doing that but for 30 years the cia had them um working as remote viewers but i want i'm bringing this up because he had said to me that um he had worked out a situation where what with one of the researchers where when he was lucid dreaming, they actually were able to have, he was able to have contact with the person in the room by blinking his eyes. And so he said when he was lucid dreaming, he was in a state that he was learning how to manage where he could get information by remote viewing in that state. And he said it was very accurate, much more than just going into that state uh, in another, uh, you know, when he goes into a room and just closes his eyes. So there's something, if you're already, um, you're already doing that you're probably very inclined to um to expand on your range of capacities there i did that actually um this happened i i want to say quite by accident but that wasn't the case um when i was in therapy after my marriage fell apart um the therapist used hypnotherapy and i had no clue what she was doing 
Um, you know, I mean, I, I could I can remember the little rhetoric she went through to put me under. And then when she would bring me back out, then she would start talking to me about stuff that had happened in my childhood or whenever. And I had no clue. I don't, don't remember her asking me those questions or anything like that. Did she use hypnosis? Yeah. Yeah. I'm sorry. And, and, and so one day she said, you know, um, I'm working on, I'm working with another client and I could really use your help. I think you could do this for me. And I was like, okay. And so she said, I'm going to hypnotize you and um, I want you to um, talk to this guy. Uh, I'm going to introduce you to somebody. I want you to talk to him and I want you then to help me figure out what's wrong with him physically. And so I thought, well, this sounds like great fun. And so we did it. And sure enough, I mean, I saw the guy clearly. I was, I was describing him to her and she would go, yeah, yeah, mm -hmm, yeah, yeah. And I talked to him and I figured out what was going on in his body. And, and that was that. And then, so I thought that was fun. Well, the next time I went back for therapy, she did this again, but this time it was, it had to do with a mother and a daughter And I don't even really remember the details of all this because this has been quite a long time ago, 2005, I guess. Mm -hmm. Um, But she was wanting me to do something in that hypnotized state that I consider to be unethical. And I mean, when you're hypnotized, you still can make choices. And You're aware, sure. Well, yeah, and so, yeah, so I I was like, eh, not going to do that. Um, yeah. You know, because well, she was really wanting good. me to intervene somehow um, and, and tell people what to do, or I don't even remember, but something like that. And, you know, it, it angered me, and I stopped the therapy right then because I thought oh, if she boy. would do this to me when I was hypnotized, yeah. then yeah. that's not an integrity. I'm not going to go there anymore. Yeah, but, for you. Yeah. You know, I was I was able to very clearly remote view into wow. these places, you know, and um, I found that fascinating. It's not anything that's really intrigued me to do more of, but I do know it works. Yeah, for sure. Well, you know what? I mean, you know, if you can find somebody you can trust, who can provide an anchoring for you um, and you could feel safe and there was a good reason for it, you know, it might be interesting to explore. But I think the thing that's most important is just feeling safe and not having fear inhibit the ability to do that, but you already right. sound like you have the range or the bandwidth to do it. Yeah. And I know if there were more hours in the day, I might <laughs> consider playing with that one. But I'm not Next time sure. I lose something, I'll call you. <laughs> okay. There you go. There you go. But anyway, um, so one of the, um, I think one of the things that I picked up from this that made me really resonate with your book was that um, you uh, believe that we shouldn't have just one time to go through a, a a physical incarnation, um, you know, and so many people believe that there's only one and I'm thinking, why would we only get one chance? Yeah. You know, well, I guess I've been a reincarnation believer for many years. I got introduced to it as a child actually. And I, my, I had a number of people in my family who were Rosicrucians. I don't know if you're familiar with the organization. I'm one. <laughs> yeah. Are you really? Okay. Oh, yeah. Well, they're yeah. non-sectarian. I need not to tell you yeah. about it, but that was early, my mother and two of my uncles and a cousin. And so that kind of thinking was all around me as a kid. Mm. And um, also had a grandfather, my mother's father, who came out of Europe and was influenced by that spiritualist thinking at the time, the early stuff that was going on in the late 1800s. And so I, one of the things that I remember was, you know, I remember being, I was raised in Catholic schools in North New Jersey, but I do remember being in third grade and when they were talking about something in religion class, putting my hand up and sort of saying, but what about reincarnation? Which took the priest back a little bit. Yeah. I think I might've been showing off a little bit with my friends to say, I know this big word, but I was, but I have over the years given it a lot of thought. And I have to say that one of the things, one of the things that intrigued me about the, 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 um, the research department at UVA was the work of Ian Stevenson, who has done a lot of work. He's you now deceased and his, um, his protege, uh, Jim Tucker, who's a friend, uh, is now working with children who remember past lives, and so I, I thought to myself, I want to be around, and I want to be around a department where people are researching reincarnation and and near death experiences and things like that. But when I think I'm kind of a developmental oriented psychologist, and so I guess I have this, I guess I have this notion that we're evolving over lifetimes. You know, mm-hmm. it's a belief, 
Um, there seems to be some evidence. I mean, even in Jim Tucker's research, some of the kids who he identifies, they seem to have characteristics that were ad- identified with the previous life that they are remembering details from. Mm-hmm. And so it does seem to make sense to me because it seems like there's a lot to learn. You know, yeah. <laughs> you know yeah. there's a lot of growth and evolving. And, you know, it just seems like, you know, especially when you think about the limited circumstances for better and or for worse, you get exposed to in a lifetime. Seems like I would, it makes sense to me rationally. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I mean, it's it's probably one of the the foundational uh, premises of my work in or speak because I don't use hypnotherapy, but I am able to take a person to another lifetime where they create a block for themselves mm-hmm. um, and they're fully conscious, but they they get it, they know what happened because you've got to heal it where it was created. Right. You can't fix some of this stuff in. 2019 you know you got to go back to 1753 and wherever it was and do some forgiveness work usually it, it usually yeah. boils down to forgiveness work or or, um, or resolve uh, unresolved traumas yeah um, all that and, stuff. you know when i um, some of the most powerful experiences i've had as the recipient and also some of the most powerful experiences i've had as a therapist is doing regression or past life therapy with people uh, they bring forward some amazing, amazing experiences, and it seems to make perfect sense because I don't just hang a shingle and say, come on in, I'll do a past life with you. Usually, right. if I do regression with people, I've been working with them for a while. Mm-hmm. I feel a sense of connection and trust, and I've done a fair scouring of their present life issues <laughs> yeah. and feel like, well, maybe there's something else here. And I you know, I wait for the opportunity for what we call the affective bridge where something feels like it's got a real strong emotional current to it. And then I'll do some um, hypnosis with them, but not nothing really deep, nothing where I'm suggesting anything. I'm very mindful right. of not suggesting anything, following the story and just having them uh, go wherever they're, you know, wherever they're, they're led to go. And they usually come up. At first, I often worried that nothing was going to happen. And then it was amazing to me how they would go to they would go to a set of circumstances and a story that would have so much to do with the things they're struggling uh-huh. with right now. And they'd have feelings, they'd have pains in their body, they'd have all kinds of memories and identify other people, and they would really feel a significant shift. Yeah, that's exactly what my work does, although it is completely a conscious thing. It's you know, uh-huh. it, um, it, no, no hypnotherapy at all. But yeah. I mean, this I is fascinating. Say one thing. People stay conscious when you do this work. I mean, nobody goes into like, nobody right. doesn't remember what they say, because I need to have them engaged with me because they're talking with me and I'm saying, what's happening now? Where are you now? Kind of thing. So and well, let me rephrase that then. Um, I don't hypnotize cause I wouldn't even know where to begin. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I have been hypnotized by this therapist, but I wouldn't know where to start uh, to try to do that. So yeah. Um, You'd probably be pretty good at it. I bet. Uh, probably, but yeah, again, <laughs> I got my plate full right now. Yeah. So. <laughs> it sounds like it. Other, there's other avenues, other, other ways to get there. Exactly. So um, listeners, You need to get your hands on this book. This is a pretty amazing book. He starts with his story, and then he will engage yours and help you to find ways that you can grow through your crises that you may or may not have had or prepare you to go through a crisis that might come up in the future. So, um, Frank, how can people get their hands on your book? Well, they can go to my website, which is my name, frankpasciutti.com. It's on Amazon. Mm-hmm. Uh, if they want to learn more about me, um, they'll see, you know, uh, a little bit about the book in there. And um, if you just go to the, you know, Amazon uh, and look at Christmas Crisis and, and put my name in there, um, I'm sure I think it's at Barnes and Nobles and other places like that. Um, but, yeah, you know, I, um, it, 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 I think it would speak to a wide audience. Um, uh, in I that agree. These, these key areas, I mean, everybody can identify with them. I try to pull it all together towards the end of the book to show how, you know, the mastery of them. And, you know, as a Rosicrucian, you know, this, it's all about mastery, right? So yeah. if you master these different dimensions through life experiences, oftentimes brought to our attention through crisis, later on, when you gain mastery over those definite different dimensions, it also, also can serve your higher functions. Yes. And I talked about the keys at a higher, a higher, uh, higher level. But yeah, the book's out there, and I welcome people to take a look at it and give me some feedback. Absolutely. That's this is great. So thank you so much for taking the time to join our viewers tonight and for joining me. I really appreciate it. And um, best best wishes for great success for your book. Well, thank you. And it was wonderful talking to you. I really enjoyed it. Me too. 
And listeners, next week, my guest is going to be a pharmacist from North Carolina. Her name is Amy Greason, and she has traveled the world going to remote, remote areas and working with indigenous people to get alternative things, uh, plants, uh, things like that, to come back in to help us to find cures for disease that we haven't been able to cure so far. She spent a lot of time in Madagascar. Um, she's, it's, some of it's pretty risky, and her story is, is freaking amazing. So <laughs> I can't wait to introduce Amy Greeson to you next week. And until next week, remember, people who take responsibility for their lives create the reality they desire. I love you all. Happy Thanksgiving. Mm-hmm.